The next author we're going to be covering is Ambrose Bierce. He has kind of a strange repertoire of writings uh, made up of journalism, short stories, and all other different kinds of genres. And he had kind of a strange life as well, but he always felt as if he was working in the shadow of other authors of his time who were more successful and more popular than him, like Mark Twain, for example. He had a real rough relationship with Mark Twain. He was born in 1842 into a large family. He was the 10th of 13 children, and he was a voracious reader almost from the start. His early life was kind of all over the place, so he rebelled against his strict Calvinistic uh, upbringing, and he left home when he was 15, and he spent the next couple of years doing all sorts of odd, odds and end jobs. Uh, he was a waiter, uh, he worked for a printer, and he worked in a brickyard. Uh, for a while, he was enrolled in the Kentucky Military School, the, the Kentucky Military Academy, but he didn't stay there for long either. When he was 18, the Civil War broke out, and he enlisted into the Union Army as a private. He saw first-hand combat on numerous occasions uh, at Philippi, uh, which was the first land battle of the war, and later at Shiloh, uh, which he wrote about in one of his short stories. He ended up serving on the staff of General William Hazen uh, as a topographical engineer, so, in other words, uh, he made the maps of the local areas where a battle was probably likely to take place. Kind of a cartographer for Hazen's unit. At the Battle of Kennesaw Mountain in 1864, uh, Beers took a bullet to the head, and he was honorably discharged about a year later after he'd recovered. His time in the Civil War had a big influence on his career as a writer, a lot of his essays and short stories have to do with the horrors of the battlefield and the things that the Union soldiers saw and did uh, during the Civil War. Uh, two of the stories that you've read for today are Civil War-inspired stories, but there was clearly a lot of uh, trauma that he'd experienced. Uh, getting shot in the head, I'm sure, couldn't have been pleasant. And a lot of his fiction writing is uh, him trying to come to terms with his time in the army and some of the things that he'd seen. After the war, General Hazen contacted him again and said that he wanted him to be part of an expedition to head out west and inspect military forts throughout the plains. Bierce agreed, and this expedition eventually uh, landed him in San Francisco, all the way over on the west coast. Uh, which was to become more or less his home for the rest of his life. He started writing as a columnist for a local newspaper. He never lasted uh, with any one paper for too long because he would have disagreements with the editors or the owners, sometimes even with other writers. Uh, but in spite of this, he soon gained a reputation as a fierce journalist, uh, a fierce critic, and as well as as a cynic. So, one collection of writings that he's well known for is what he called the uh, Cynics uh, Word Book, uh, which was a book that contained, bas it was basically a dictionary, but uh, all of the de definitions of words were his own take on what the words really meant. So, for example, you would read under the definition of love, it's a temporary insanity curable by marriage, right? or under the definition of lawyer, uh, one skilled in circumvention of the law. Cynical definitions. Uh, his journalism and his short stories tended to focus on the inscrutable, on how little we know about the universe and about the absurdity of human endeavors, human actions, as well as the absurdity of death. His writings have been described as dark, uh, realistic, uh, but also as sometimes supernatural, almost. It's probably fair to say that he wasn't a happy man. Uh, he kept a human skull on his writer's desk uh, for inspiration, I guess, and no one ever knew where he'd got it from or whose skull it had been. Uh, he had married a woman named Molly Day, and he seemed happy with her, and he had three children with her, but he ended up surviving all of them except for the youngest daughter. 
Both of his sons died under tragic circumstances, uh, and his wife, uh, because he was such a distant, depressed sort of character, eventually had an affair with a Danish gentleman, uh, which Beers found out about, and he immediately packed up his things and left. Uh, Molly, his wife, she would die some years later, uh, unreconciled to him. And around this time, uh, he became a heavy drinker, too. Uh, Andy was also struggling financially. Uh, he moved back east to the region which would later become South Dakota uh, for a while, uh, taking up a mining job there. Uh, but things didn't work out there, and so he came back to San Francisco. And finally, he was hired on as a journalist onto a paper called The Examiner by its owner, William Randolph Hearst who was an extremely big name at the time. He was a politician, a businessman, and a newspaper publisher. Uh, He ended up, he ran for president. Uh, He was elected to Congress a couple of times. Hearst was a a big player in politics uh, in the late 19th century. So Hearst actually sought Bierce out for this newspaper because he admired the journalism and the short stories from him that he'd already seen in other newspapers. And Ambrose Bierce was a fierce opponent of the railroad companies, and he, some of his most scathing journalism was written against uh, what was known as the Railroad Refinancing Bill in 1896 which was essentially a government bailout of the Central Pacific Railroad Company. Uh, Hearst sent Beers to Washington, D.C. to do what he could to stop the bill from passing. Beers wrote a whole bunch of articles that uh, got the people riled up to the point where the bill failed to pass, and so Beers and Hearst were successful in uh, taking on the railroads. And around this time, around the same time, he was writing some of his best fiction, uh, and perhaps his most famous work, An Occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge, uh, which you read. Uh, That was a story uh, that was immediately popular. Uh, Critics liked it. General readers liked it. It was adapted onto film several times once film started becoming a thing. And it even served as the premise of a Twilight Zone episode, too. Perhaps the strangest thing about Bierce is the manner in which he died, or uh, uh, didn't die. Nobody really knows what happened to him, uh, even to this day. All they know was that he was about 70 years old, I think he was 71, when he decided that he was going to travel south. He wanted to revisit some of the battlefields that he had fought on during the Civil War, And then he was going to go into Mexico and join the army of Pancho Villa, who was a general in the Mexican Revolution, which was happening at the time. From some letters that he sent back to his daughter and some friends, uh, it seems he did eventually join up with Villa's army uh, as an observer. He wasn't uh, fighting hand-to-hand or anything at 70 years old. But then after those letters, all trace of him vanished. Uh, And all we have are contradictory word-of-mouth traditions and guesses from different biographers. Some say he was wandering with a convoy when he was executed by an opposing general. Some say that he died on a field of battle. Uh, there There were even rumors that he was spotted in France, fighting a war over there. How he got there, who knows. Uh, Others said that he came home and lived a peaceful life. And still others uh, think that he killed himself. And it's an unsolved mystery. Uh, We don't know what happened to Ambrose Bierce, and we don't have his body. So I mentioned that an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge was one of his most famous stories. Uh, The actual action of this story is pretty simple. A southern gentleman is being executed by hanging from a railroad bridge during the Civil War. Uh, by Union soldiers. What makes the story interesting is how uh, inside of the civilian's head we as the readers are right before he's killed. So he experiences this long delusion where he actually escapes the noose. Uh, It breaks, he's carried downstream after he lands in the river below, he manages to avoid all of the gunshots of the soldiers, 
and eventually he makes his way back home to his wife and children. Uh, but the entire delusion has taken place in the span of time that it takes for his neck to snap. Uh, the story has a twist ending, in other words. Uh, he hadn't escaped at all. Uh, he had just fantasized desperately in his final moments that he had. Instead of his life flashing before his eyes, as the expression goes, he got this nice illusion that uh, he was free and escaped. And then he died. And this is an example of stream of consciousness writing, where we're not reading what's actually happening in the story, but only about what the character thinks or perceives is happening. And we'll talk more about this concept uh, in class because it became a very popular form of uh, writing moving on into the 20th century. Uh, some authors such as James Joyce later on would uh, make stream of consciousness writing uh, mainstream uh, and extremely popular and well known and studied. Another one of Bierce's stories with a twist ending is The Eyes of the Panther. And this story highlights more of Bierce's macabre uh, tending to supernatural style. Uh, this is a story that we might imagine someone like Edgar Allan Poe writing. But, like uh, Owl Creek Bridge, it plays uh, with flashbacks and with nonlinear storytelling, and it's really the method in which Bierce is telling the story that makes it uh, unique and original. Uh, we hear about a woman who fears that she's insane, and she won't marry because of that, and she fears that she's insane due to the circumstances of her birth. And then uh, the man who loves her eventually ends up shooting her at night as she's peering in through his chamber window uh, because he thinks that she's a panther uh, leaping in through the window that he'd left open. And the reason that he thought this uh, was because of the story that the woman had told him of her mother and of her older sibling how a panther had looked in through her mother's window and the mother in her fright had smothered her first child to death. Uh, and then later on, she had had uh, this current woman and that's why the woman thought she was insane uh, because the, the circumstances of her birth were so inauspicious. So again, the plot is relatively straightforward, but it's the manner in which Bierce tells it that creates all of the suspense and the surprise. Uh, the third story, A Horseman in the Sky, is another Civil War story uh, where a Union soldier spies his father, a Confederate soldier, on a clifftop sitting on a horse. Uh, his father doesn't see him. He's hiding. He's a scout. But he's got his gun, and so he takes aim. Uh, not wanting to shoot his father, he shoots the horse instead. But this causes the horse to run off the cliff, and it ends up killing his father anyway. It's a heart-wrenching tale about uh, some of the struggles that soldiers in the Civil War really had to go through. In many cases, it was brother against brother, uh, father against son. Uh, the soldier in the story is torn between his patriotic duty and his filial duty, and he tries to strike a compromise but ultimately isn't able to do so. We'll talk more about these stories in detail uh, when we meet for class, so uh, that'll be all for now. Thanks.